Apparently, I'm preaching with a view. <laughs> and I think I should have nerves. And I can tell you, I do have nerves. And I have nerves every time I preach. Every time I preach. Not because I am preaching with a view, but because every time I preach, I am under a view, under God's view. And every time I preach, I have no confidence in me at all. I may not show that because there are years of experience in hiding that lack of confidence, but I have fully confidence in Him. And if I aim for something this morning, as I always aim, is not to impress, not to attract attention on me at all, but to be faithful to His Word, to be faithful to the one who called me to this ministry. And one more thing that I would like not to fail this morning. During the Civil War in America, President Lincoln, the 16th President of the United States, was facing very tough times, and he almost fell down into a deep, deep depression. Because every day he heard bad reports, more blood, more deaths. His days were full of tension and his nights were restless. One day he decided to go to church. It was a Sunday and he thought he would find a place where he can refresh his soul. He took his aid with him. And just two of them, on those days when a president just could walk freely without bodyguards uh, on the capital city, they went to a Presbyterian church. In a way that they didn't want to attract attention on them. They, they, they found a, a corner in an unlit area of the building, so they sat there. And the preacher preached the sermon. It was a good sermon. After the service finished, President Lincoln sat on that chair for a few more minutes. His aide leaned towards him and asked, what do you think? Uh, was it a good sermon? And Lincoln said, I think the sermon was well prepared. It was well delivered. The point were clear, logical. The preacher was sincere. So that was a good sermon, isn't it? And Lincoln paused a little bit and then he said, no, I think he failed. Failed? Good point, biblical, well presented, clear, sincere. And Lincoln said, considering that particular case, the civil war, the preacher failed to call us, to ask of us something great. We are not challenged. And I don't want to fail in this particular area this morning. Because I'm going to preach on a vast subject, but touch a little bit of it. The concept of God's call to ministry. And whenever God calls, He calls us to something great. We have a great God that cannot call us to something small. And that I don't want to fail this morning on calling you and calling this church, and remind me that we are called to something great. I'm looking in this room, and that's the privilege of being here for almost five years, four years and a few months with you, getting to know each other. I'm not preaching for the first time. 
And I'm looking and I wonder how many of you right now feel you are in a place of greatness? How many of you right now look at your life and you can see something significant happening? That you are touching many lives and you are changing people's lives around you. That you have a real impact in this society. That you have a word to say. That you are a tool in God's hands. How many of you feel you are in that place of greatness? When we are talking about God's call, there are several areas that we need to discuss. And I will briefly, briefly... Uh, go into a technical side, a technical bit, then I will move towards a devotional part of my message. You don't know yet where in the Bible will be. The technical side I refer to is the nature of God's call. Then in the transition, we will move to some common mistakes that we people make in regards to God's call. So we will see the nature of God's call, common mistakes we do in regards to God's call, and then some objections that we tend to have in regards to God's call. That will be the devotional side of the message. Bear with me a little bit on the technical side of the subject. The nature of God's call. We have a general call that God has for all people. The call for salvation. When we come to uh, Christians, we are called to holiness. We are called to serve God in a way or another. We were gifted in order to be able to serve Him. So we are all called to something. But then there is a specific call that God has for some people in specific areas. And when we look in the New Testament, especially uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, a verse that I referred even last night, God says here in His Word that Christ, when He ascended to heaven, He gave people gifts... He gave us gifts, and the Holy Spirit of God, of God gives us gifts in order to be able to serve in the general way according to our gifts. But in Ephesians chapter 4, we see that God also gives people as gifts to His church. You see the difference? He gives people gifts to serve on His general call. But then, specifically, he says, we give people, I give, as gifts to the church. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, pastors and teachers. These are God's gifts to his church. And these people have a special calling on their life. This is not just a vocation. This is not just a career. And when we are looking for a pastor or for an evangelist or for a person like that, we need to make sure that God called in a specific way that person. So the first thing I'm looking is to see if that person is called, it has the right character, and then lastly I'm looking on the competences. And there is this saying that will equip the cold. God equips the cold. We don't start with the competences, but with that special call. Now, you may think, and we often think, that these special calls normally come early in life. Yes? So these people are called early in life. Now, imagine for a moment that you are God. You are the creator of the universe, and you possess all power within yourself. You can do 
whatever you like. And you can choose any person on the planet to do great things. Your people are slaves in Egypt. And it's time to rescue them. And it's time to raise a man, a mighty man, a great man, to do great things, to deliver those people out of slavery. Who would you pick up on? Who would you choose? Would any one of you choose Moses? An 80 years old Bedouin shepherding the flock of his father-in-law for 40 years, the one who had once a great chance in his life, great opportunities, but he blew it, who had to run because he has a criminal record. If he had to fill a DBS check, he wouldn't pass. Would you choose that person? Can God do mighty things with a man like that? We have it in the Bible. So please turn with me in Exodus chapter 3 and 4. I'm not going to read these two chapters. <laughs> they are pretty long. But we are going to study them. After we've seen this nature of God's call, I want to reinforce two, three things uh, in regards to that, looking specifically, specifically on, on Moses' life. When God calls, he calls personally. If you look with me in verse 4, we know the story one day, Moses passed a little bit beyond the border with his flocks. He was wandering in that desert, hot sun, hot sand. And one day, at that particular day, one moment, he sees this burning bush. Nothing, nothing um, out of common to see a burning bush in a desert. What's actually curious about that burning bush? It doesn't consume. He has seen many burning bushes, but this one keeps on burning, keeps on burning, keeps on burning. And he comes closer out of curiosity. Why isn't this bush consuming? And out of the bush that day, an external call, not just an inner call, not just a desire within himself to serve God, but an external call from God upon his life. Personally, Moses, Moses, Moshe, Moshe in Hebrew. And just imagine, just imagine, just place yourself in the shoes of Moses after 40 years, 40 years of brokenness, of failure, of wondering, how could I blow it that badly? I'm a nobody in this desert. We know nothing about his spiritual life. Hearing his name, he hasn't forgotten me. He still remembers me. He knows my name. Moshe. And as a result, Moses responds with a very simple word in Hebrew, Heneni. You didn't have to touch your lips. Heneni, here am I. God's call is always personal. And if you never experience that, you cannot really understand the mystery the mightiness, the beauty of this experience. But when God calls to something great, 
He's doing it personally. You have to have that encounter with him. Then God's call, it's still the technical side, yes? It's precise. It's precise. He never calls in general. Uh, I'm calling you to do some things. Just, just follow and we'll see what we are doing. Just be there in the church and try to do something. Find your way. No, no. If you look at verse 10, so now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. A very precise instruction. When God calls, he calls personally, but precisely, you know exactly what you are called for. Go. Where? To the very place you don't want to go. Where you are wanted for murder. Exactly where you blew it. Go. <laughs> go. And I'll go back to that. To the objects that Moses has. And we often have too. And lastly, on, under the nature of God's call. When we consider God's call, it's interestingly to discover that always God works beforehand, providentially. God's call is personal, God's call is precise, and God's call is providentially prepared in advance. There are no things to happen. There are no coincidences as we discussed some time ago when we look at the uh, God's will concept on that Sunday. And um, just considering and reflecting during these weeks on the experience we have and the options and the perspective that we have and uh, what we are exploring together, it's interesting to see how God worked in advance before of us, preparing things to happen, placing all these small little um, puzzle pieces and when you look back, you understand, you see the picture. But at that very moment, sometimes it may look so messy. If you look at Moses' life, nothing is a coincidence. Have you ever tried to play an if game? What if game? What if his parents never had the courage to hide him for a certain time? Because they didn't want it to uh, let people know they had a boy and he could be killed. What if uh, Moses' mom didn't have that courage to put him in the basket and uh, allow to, to, not to swim, to float on the Nile? What if on exactly that time the foreign Pharaoh doubter wouldn't go to swim and have a bath in the Nile. What if Moses would sleep so deeply and he wouldn't cry so she couldn't hear him? What if her heart wouldn't be so open <laughs> to accept him and to want him in her own family? What if, what if, what if? There is no if. Because God prepares everything in advance. And he knows what he's doing. What if at this experience Moses wouldn't uh, decide to turn back and look and watch carefully to see why that bush isn't consuming? But there is no what if. So God prepares in advance all things. This is the nature of God's call. Now, some common mistakes that we may do in regards to God's call, looking in the life of Moses. The first one that Moses did when he was 40, when, when he really was mighty in, in word and deeds, as Stephen puts it in Acts 7. The first common mistake, we can run before we are set. We tend to run to do things before we are set. To do it by God. Reading Acts 7 and um, Hebrew 11, we understand that actually Moses understood 
And he thought that God is the one who calls him to deliver God's people. But he did it out of time, out of God's time. And timing is important. It's one thing to know, yes, I have this call. And the other thing is to have patience until God set us to do something. And timing is important. So this is one mistake that often people do. Running before they are being set or sent by God in ministry. The second mistake is that after we fail, we tend to retreat. And he went far away in the shadow. I blew it. I'm a broken person. I failed. I'm not good. I cannot serve God anymore. I had my chance. But now, eight, 40 years after that particular moment, I have nothing else than memories. And even those memories are fading. And I wonder how many of us think the same. How many of us retreat after we failed? And we think, God cannot use me anymore. I had my chance. Too late now. Well, we see in this experience of Moses that after 40 years, when he is 80, when he looks at himself and says, that's it. Now my hope, if I have any hope, would be that others will do it, not me. Thinking of yesterday, several questions, and one of them was that all people have settled thoughts. Difficult to change, difficult to accept new ideas. We have settled thoughts. Think of Moses. Forty years in the desert, would have he have settled thoughts? Yes. And yet, to a man like him, God comes and asks of him something great. The third mistake that we all tend to do. First one, we run ahead before we are set. We tend to retreat after we fail. And the third one, we resist when we are called. We resist when we are called. And this is the particular area I would like to emphasize this morning. Looking from verse 11, till somewhere in mid-chapter 4, we are going to look at uh, some of the objections that Moses has when God calls him to this great thing. And we may have them the same. I certainly had and still have some of these objections. Every time God called me to something great, I said no, to start with. Then he had his own way of making me saying, yes, hey, Nanny, here am I. First objection. Uh, after God said, now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh, that very place you don't want to go. And says, I will be with you in verse 12. But in verse 11, Moses' objection, who am I? Who am I to go? Who am I to do these great things? Who am I to be able to accomplish such a high task? It's far beyond and above me. Who am I? I am a nobody. I am capable of nothing at this stage of my life. Oh, yes, once, yes. Once I had enough strength. Once I was somebody. I had a good reputation 
uh, the Pharaoh perhaps had his eye on him to be the no next one to replace. Perhaps he had a chest full of medals, but not now. Who am I? Lack of confidence. And God wants us to be exactly in the same place when he is calling us to do something great. You know what? Because we are ne never able to do something great when we rely on ourselves. We cannot do something great when we don't accept the idea that the whole call, the whole task is far beyond me. I am not good to accomplish it. What is God's answer to this? Verse 12, I will be with you. I will be with you. It's my presence. It's not you, but it's my presence with you who empowers. So I'm just looking on, on this specific role that I might take. And I often think, who am I? Who am I? Nobody. I said the same in 1994 when God called me for the first time to his ministry. And I kept saying it several times in my life. And what's the beauty of it is that every time God says exactly the same thing. My presence will come along you. I will be with you. And uh, for the first time, I preached even at Emmaus this message. But last night, I've noticed another aspect that I missed. At the end of um, verse 12, there is another promises. The first one is, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. I will be with you while you go. You will return. And we will have a meeting here on this mountain. And you will worship me. If you trust in me. <laughs> it's amazing. There will be a reunion. You just go and do what I'm sending you to do. Don't trust in yourself, but in my presence. And we will meet again here, and you will worship this God who is now sending you. The second objection of Moses is in verse 13. If the, one, if the first one has to do with him, with himself, the second one has to do with God. And he says, when I'm going to meet these people and do what you say, they are going to ask me, what is his name? Who is the one who sends you? Uh, God, to be honest, I don't know you enough. And they are going to raise the same question. And God's answer to this. In other words, this is a problem of authority. That he has. The first one is the problem of confidence in himself. The second one is who is sending you? What sort of recommendations you have? We are living in a day of commendations. You can do nothing today without several commendations. Who sends you? Who is the one who sends you? I have no authority. And God says, I am. Tell them and say that I am who I am, Yahweh. That's enough. <laughs> what? It's not much in that, God. Well, I actually, Moses, I'm giving you a blank check. You go with a blank check signed by me. And as you obey and as you go and as you are set to do what I'm calling you to do, great things. And you encounter needs. And you encounter 
obstacles and you encounter opposition, just know that I am everything that you will need at that moment. I am the eternal I am. I am Yahweh. I am the one who causes things. I am the one who determines things to happen. And I am everything you will need along the way on this journey. If you want to do great things, be sure I am the one who can cover up all your needs. If you will be discouraged, I will be your encouragement. If you will feel you are abandoned, I will be with you. I just send my presence will be with you. If you realize you have no power, I am the Almighty. I am. When you will have no peace, I am the peace. I am every single thing that you will need when you are going to fulfill the task. And while we still have confidence in ourselves, we cannot discover what He is. We rely on our authority, on our power, on our resources. But if you want to see who is He, just do what He wants. And He is the I am that you need. Then, there is so much to say in here, but uh, I'm unconscious of the time. We go in chapter 4. You may think by now Moses should have been like, God, okay, God, I'm ready. I'm ready. Just hearing who God is. But he's not. And he says, okay, I understand that I am nobody, but you will be with me, so your presence will cover me. I understand that I have no authority, but you, you, the eternal I am, cover up, and you will be my authority. But now, the first problem was with me, the second one was with you, solved. What if, when I go there, they don't believe me? They wouldn't accept me. And he fears rejections and opposition. And as human beings, we always think, would they accept me? Would they believe that God called me to do that? And we have concerns in this area. God has a simple way to answer. Actually, there are three acts, three actions and because of times, I'm going to cover up only one, only one this morning. In order to help Moses to understand that they will eventually accept him as their leader, he's asked to do three things. And the first one, God raised a question. What do you have in your hands? What is that in your hand? Look at in verse one, uh, verse 2, verse, uh, chapter 4. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your staff? And I just imagine moment, uh, for a moment Moses at this stage. It's like when you play volleyball and the ball comes exactly where you need it. And you hit it hard. Yes, Lord, uh, I, I thank you for raising this question. Well, I have a staff, a rod, a stick. A dead stick. That's all I have at this moment in life. What do you want me to do with that? I'm happy you raised the question. I only have a rod, a staff. And this, oh, you have no idea how much it changed my life. And I can see God looking at Moses and say, okay, even that is too much. Throw it on the ground. Throw it. Set it on the ground. I want to see you with empty hands. Why? Because I believe in that stuff, in that road, a shepherd stuff, a, a shepherd stick, Moses lean and 
rely his whole life. Because that stuff for him, at that very moment in life, represents, represented his personality. Could represent his personality. Whoever would see him from the distance with that stuff in hand would immediately know he is a shepherd. You cannot get rid of that. If you walk in boots and um, uh, a specific um, kind of dressing, people immediately associate that with your uh, career, therefore with your personality and everything that you are. With that stuff, he would um, protect his flocks, he would um, uh, be able to climb or go down the mountain. With that stuff, he did some things for his sheep, but for 40 years, that stuff in his hand perhaps would have been a reminder that he had a chance, that he once held a scepter, and he could become a king, a pharaoh, but now it's only a shepherd. That stuff represents his old possession. The sheep, the flock, were not his. They belonged to his father-in-law. His only possession would have been that stuff. That stuff would have been his problems. As I said, perhaps during 40 years, once again and again and again, he would connect things what he had, what he has. And he cannot easily overcome that brokenness. But in that stuff also holds his potential. And when God says, throw it on the ground, throw it, that dead stick, dry wood, suddenly turn into a living a snake. And the Bible says that um, Moses started running. He would see plenty snakes, plenty snakes in the desert. I'm absolutely sure. Perhaps this snake is not an ordinary snake. We don't know for sure, but it could be a cobra. It could be a cobra, a different, a dangerous snake that Moses started running, but this is in connection what he knows the Egyptian worshipped. Because they used to worship a cobra. And once he had a septum with a cobra head in his hand. And he is now called to use that stuff to prove that his God is beyond the gods of Egypt. It is a proof from, for himself, it is a proof for his people, and there is going to be a proof for the Egyptians. That stuff in his hands was just a tool for his flock. But that stuff, when it was thrown on the ground, abandoned, when he held on nothing else than God, and God takes hold on what he has. That stuff turned to do mighty things in Moses' hand. He took it back. And with that stuff, he brought at least six plagues upon Egypt. With that stuff, he parted the Red Sea. With that stuff... He caused the Red Sea to come together again and drown Pharaoh and his army. With that stuff, he brought water from the rock in the desert. With that stuff, he brought victory upon Amalekites. But that stuff, since he brought it back from the ground, wasn't his anymore. But it's God's stuff in Moses' hands. So if you want to do great things, and God is calling us to do great things. In order to do that, He's asking, what are you holding in your hands? You know what? 
what we hold in our hands hold us from doing what God wants us to do. I want to repeat that. Whatever you hold and I hold in my hand holds me to do what God wants me to do. I might have some possessions that I'm holding and I'm not yet ready to release it for God. I may hold too much on my personality. This is me and I cannot change and I would never change. This is me. You might hold on your problems. You might hold on your past, like Moses. And what you hold, holds you. What I hold, holds me. But do you realize that whatever you hold, when you are ready to release in God's hands, will turn to be the greatest potential in your hand? And when you release it in God's hands, and He then wants you to take it back in order to administrate it, there might be ways that you never thought you are called to do it. When God says to Moses, now stretch your hand and take it by the tail, you might know, at least from television, I know from practice, actually, that whenever you want to catch a, a, a snake, you would never take it by the tail. Why? Because the snake will turn and bite. If you want to catch a, snail, a snake, you always catch it behind the, the head. And then you do whatever you want with it. Why is God asking Moses to catch it by the tail? You see, if you release the things that he wants you to release and you hold on, he wants you and he wants me to release the methods that I always thought they should be the same. The, there are different means and methods that God may want to use in his ministry. And if I hear something in every church I minister, there are voices like, we always done things this way. <laughs> yeah? Well, if you really want to do great things, and our God is asking us to do great things, Except that sometimes great things come even after changing methods, ways of doing things. If I, what I do right now doesn't cause great things to happen, what I'm doing right now actually doesn't place myself in a place of greatness, why do I need to hold on the same old methods? Why? It is God who says, throw it on the ground and then take it differently. But I think there is another element there. It's an element of trust. Trust in me. Your problem here, Moses, is that you fear people. You fear that they will not trust in you. You'll fe you fear that they will not accept you. Therefore, look. I'm asking you to do things unusual. Trust in me. I'm going to protect you. And might be also a Christological implication, but I'm not going into that. There are two other things that Moses is asked to do here, to place his hands uh, in, in the chest and uh, with the lepros and later on to um, turn the water into blood, but I'm not covering. And I'm going towards the end um, of his argument with God uh, in chapter 4, verse 10. He sees all these miracles. 
He hears all God's answers to his objections. And you may think, okay, he is now convicted, he is now decided to obey and to go and to do whatever God called him to do. And this actually reinforced what somebody said yesterday, all people have settled thoughts. He sees all these things. Yes, true, true. And then he says, <coughs> oh, 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 okay, God. But, 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 but I have no abilities. I have a speech problem. You answered all the other needs. But I thought you already know that I am, I have an issue with speech. As he's saying something new to God. I am slow to speech. I have never been eloquent. Oh, how I understand Moses. Oh, how I understand Moses in this area. Not only in English. Not only in English, but even in Romanian. Because I always, I always fear and I have issues speaking in public. I always have a dry mouth. That's why I always carry water with me. It is a physical issue that I face in the area of speech. And yet, God does what he wants. So I do understand him. And I do understand people who come with the same excuse. Maybe not because you cannot speak English properly, but you may think, I don't have the right words, I don't have that eloquence, I don't have the, the, the passion in the speech, I don't know how to say it, I don't have the experience, uh, I don't have abilities. And in whatever God calls you to do, we always look and say, we have no, no abilities in doing that. That's right. That's right. We don't have. And he knows that. And when God called us to serve him in any particular area, you name it, from the pulpit or just saying hello to people when they come here, but going out in the world and make disciples of Christ, he has a bunch of people out there that need salvation. He has a lot of people who desperately need a message of hope, especially nowadays. Who do you think he calls? Angels? The brightest people in this world? You may think you are not the brightest bulb right here. Would you call a bunch of people like us? to fulfill his, his great commission, and yet he chose us. Sinners saved by grace to go with this message to other sinners who need God's grace. This is great. This is greater than us. And he is the one who calls. He is the one who empowers. If you look throughout the Bible, None of God's people ever felt they are good for the task. When God came to Moses, he said, B -b 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 no. When he came to Jeremiah, he said, I'm too young. When he came to Isaiah, he said, I have problem with my tongues, with my speak. Because I, I have dirty lips. I'm quoting from Romanian. When he came to Amos, he said, I, I'm just a fig picker. Who am I? When he came to his disciples, they were fishermen. And they fell down to Jesus' feet, Jesus feet, saying, go away from us. We are sinners. And yet he calls them to be his disciples. When he called Noah to build an ark, I'm sure Noah said, an ark? What's that? 
What is that for? I have never heard. That project was far too big for him. I'm pretty sure that David felt pretty small comparing to Goliath. I'm pretty sure Daniel in the lion's den felt completely inadequate. <laughs> All these people looking on themselves knew that they are incapable, too small, unprepared, skilled, zero for, God, for what God calls. And yet, God did mighty things with them. Because it's not up to me to do great things. To me, it's up, if you can put it this way, it's up to me to answer God's call to do what he wants to do. And he can do only God great things. So just a quick recap. The concept of God's call. The nature of God's call. It's a general call. A call to salvation, a call to holiness, a call to serve in many areas according to our gifts. But he calls special people and he gives them as gifts to his church. These are special calls upon their lives. When he calls these people, he does it personally, precisely, providentially. Facing this call, we are tempted to do several mistakes. One, to run ahead God's call, or before we are set. After we fail, we tend to retreat. And when God calls us in a specific way, even when we are in the shadow, we tend to resist. First excuse of Moses, I have no confidence in me. Good. That's what I wanted, actually. It took me 40 years to get you here. Because I cannot use people full of themselves. I don't know you enough. If you want to know me enough, go. In motion, you will discover who I am. And I'll cover up all your needs. And in the Great Commission... After Jesus Christ says, go and make disciples of all nations. What is Matthew uh, 28, verse 20 saying? And I will be with you always. Always. But just go. And as you go, as you do what I'm calling you to do, <laughs> you will discover that I am there to help you. Third excuse of Moses, them, them. They may not believe, they may not accept me. How can I convince them? Well, Moses, what do you have in your hand? Throw it on the ground. If you really want to convince people, Go with empty hands. No. Go with full hands. With things that you already abandoned to me. You go with this stuff. But this stuff is not yours anymore. It's mine. I am sending you. And what, with what you have, give it to me. You'll go back and people will see miracles. You see that point? And then, uh, I'm not good enough, I'm not good in speech, I'm not, I'm not skilled, I, I have no competences. God il, will equip the call. And here, <laughs> God made a very important promise to, um, to Moses. I will be your mouth. I will speak. I will be there to speak through your mouth. Moses still resists. Send someone else, Lord. Send, you know, I see, I see. It's great. I, it, it sounds good. But let someone else to experience that. And then he gave up. 
And God sends Aaron to be his partner. I always wonder how it would have been if Moses would accept his, uh, God's first offer. Not to have Aaron, but God himself speaking through his mouth. Aaron caused him some problems. Well, we have a partner today. It's the Holy Spirit who is given to us all. And we celebrated uh, the Pentecost last Sunday. He would never, never cause us problem as Aaron did to Moses. He is with us to empower us, to give us strength and strength in words, in deeds, in everything we do, to uh, enrich our life, to enlighten our minds, and to use us for these great things that God is calling us. Are you up for? Are you up for personally? Are you up for as a church? These great things can happen regardless who the pastor is. These great things can happen only when we lay our uh, life completely to God. Amen.